May the truth of God's word resonate in your hearts, dear ones. Cast aside your prejudices and what man has taught and embrace the depth of scripture. I need to make an apology because I have quoted Mike from around the world a few times. And last night I heard one of his messages where he said, No man can forgive sins. I just want to refer to John 20, 23 where the King James Scripture states, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. I want to make it clear to you, family, that the Lord Jesus Christ, in red letters, affirmed to his apostles that they were given the authority from on high, from Christ himself, to forgive men's sins. However, we know that God will not be mocked, and if his soul is not truly repentant, I personally do not believe that their sins can be totally forgiven because of their insincerity. Nonetheless, in other matters, the apostles were appointed to forgive sins, even as it is written in John 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, Even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. End of quote. That's just plain scripture, dear ones, and in all things we must adhere to scripture especially when they are the words of Christ himself. I'd like to refer you to the seventh episode of the Chosen series by Dallas Jenkins. They have an app for it, and it's on YouTube. And particularly the scene where the Pharisee was thinking, no man can forgive sins, because Jesus was about to heal the paralytic. And here is the story. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say this to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This scene is portrayed word for word by Dallas in the Chosen series, and it really catches the atmosphere around the religious spirit of the Pharisee that was at the window criticizing him. 
Now, I want to share with you that the only reason I've listened to Mike from around the world is because he has very accurate information on the sciences that affect our planet, especially geology, astronomy, and the magnetosphere, and as well as understanding movements and repercussions of the solar system moving around, which is so unstable right now. Other than that, I cannot endorse his teachings, though I really appreciate his very direct approach to getting us all to walk while we talk <laughs> and be authentic Christians. The world is going to need us to be authentic when these things come upon it. He has also taught on the stability of a true believer, even when the world around him is falling apart. Dear ones, we must be very serious about our prayers for the world and our elected officials, and we must have a deeply personal relationship with Jesus and obedience to Him. He's our anchor on the stormy seas of life, as well as the Holy Spirit being the captain of our little vessel. Mike also made a statement about Mary. Mary can't save you. And he's correct. Our Lady was not the one who died on the cross, although she is the one who most closely suffered, watching her divine Son give his life's blood in agony to atone for our sins. But again, I must point to several scriptures where the Lord outlines her role in the Church. The wedding at Cana. She was presented to the world as the intercessor who petitioned her son to do a miracle, which for him was out of season. He was not ready to do that. In other words, what Jesus would not do on his own, for he certainly knew they were low on wine. He did because the person who asked him had a privileged relationship with him. So this is the story. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why does this concern us? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish rites of purification. Each could hold from twenty to thirty gallons. And Jesus told the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now, draw some out, he said, and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not know where it was from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone serves the fine wine first, and then the cheap wine after the guests are drunk. But you have saved the fine wine until now. Jesus performed this, the first of his signs, at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. That's the second chapter of John. By the way, this incident is portrayed superbly in the Chosen series by Dallas Jenkins. It's simply wonderful. I've watched it over and over again, really authentic. It gives you a great look into the Jewish tradition and what life was like back in those days, and certainly what a Jewish wedding was like. Moving on, Mary knew her son very well. She needed no verbal confirmation from him, yet in her heart she knew he would perform this miracle. That's why she told the servants to do whatever they were told. By the way, in her apparitions and messages around the world, she is still telling us to do what we are told to do by Jesus. She knows what pleases him, and I believe she is also very much the mother of the bride. In any case, it is clear from this incident in Scripture 
that Mary had a privileged relationship with her son as an intercessor for those in need. Guys, the body of Christ outside the liturgical churches has gone out of its way to discredit her and turn people away from her intercession. And even in this incident, it is notable. She was grief-stricken that the wine had run out because she knew how embarrassing it would be for the couple. And her merciful heart reached out to her son because she knew that he too was merciful. The cut and dried solution to this would be to allow them to suffer this degradation. But Mary intervenes and entreats her son to do what he was not willing to do on his own initiative. This is so typical of Our Lady. She is tender, gentle, merciful, and yet she never compromises with sin. She weeps for the sinner, helping against hope that Jesus will give them another chance. There's a wide gap between evangelical cut and dried relationships and those who have a relationship with Mary. They tend to be so much more forgiving, merciful, and gentle. This was something I recognized early on when I converted from the evangelical church. Here is another incident that confirms her great dignity among men in Luke chapter 1. It begins, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Moving on now to the end of John's book, he is the only disciple who stood at the foot of the cross, and because of that it could also be said that he represented all of the disciples and the church. The narrative begins, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. That's from John 19. I believe this was symbolic of Mary's role, not only to John, but to the disciples as well, and eventually the entire church. And traditionally, uh, Luke's gospel is accredited to Mary. And he got his information from her because he was not a part of the disciples at that time. You may argue that point, but I want to remind you of what happened the night before when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He did that to show them what their relationship should be with one another. And it was an example of how he uses seemingly unimportant actions and words to symbolize and mirror a greater truth. The Lord has promised that those who are faithful on this earth shall receive greater rewards in heaven. In Matthew 25, 23, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into your master's joy. Are these not the words we all long to hear in that fateful moment when we stand before our Lord and our works are judged? Now, if Scripture declares Mary 
the mother of Jesus, as being blessed by all generations. It stands to reason that she is also blessed right now in this generation. And this implies she did well with what was entrusted to her. Therefore, I believe she will be given greater duties and appointments in heaven. What I'm trying to say, dear heart dwellers, is of course Mary has not the ability to save anyone, since only the blood of Jesus and his suffering on the cross opened the gates of heaven and paid the price for our sins. He is our redemption. However, she does have an expanded authority given to her from her son because she was faithful on earth. That significantly works in the favor of those who are petitioning her for a miracle out of season. In other words, a miracle that no one deserves, but that is given into her hands to dispense because of her faithfulness and great honor in heaven. Therefore, she has the privilege of drawing on the great storehouse of graces her son has accumulated for his angels and servants in heaven to distribute according to their office and function in the established order of his kingdom. Putting it another way, in a healthy family environment, if a son wants to ask a very big favor from his father, and he knows his father is not well disposed to give it, who will he go to? His mother, of course. She has a relationship with the father that is highly favored. And if she asks, she is more likely to have the request granted than the son. All of us, dear ones, all of us will be given more to do in heaven based on our faithfulness on earth. All of us will wear crowns and cast them at the feet of God. So there is nothing that implies that Mary cannot be a queen in heaven. Where we get confused is that Satan has a personage he calls the queen of heaven, who is nothing more than a filthy demon with that title. So let us be sure when addressing Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, it is Mary herself that we are addressing as our intercessor in our petitions. And do not be fooled by the empty argument that there's only one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. To say that in the context of excluding intercessors makes absolutely no sense, since we are told to pray without ceasing, to imitate Christ who is in heaven who prays without ceasing, And if we have him living in our hearts here, how much more so in heaven? So how can we refrain from praying in heaven? The Holy Spirit gives us insight into what's going on. Find me one scripture passage that states no one in heaven can pray for someone on earth. Bring me that scripture and you will have an argument against the great cloud cheering us on that says those in the cloud can watch, can worry, can cheer us on, but they cannot pray? How absurd and senseless is that? Can you imagine seeing your son's life from heaven and not praying as he walks near to the precipice of sin? Of course you'd pray. So finally, my dear ones, these ministers that insist Mary is insignificant and the saints cannot pray from heaven, and no man can forgive sins, are speaking only what they've been taught, not what is in Scripture. The body of Christ will never come together until they learn and examine these passages of Scripture. Both sides of the body have something to offer. It's a shame that it's divided. It should not be mutually exclusive. Either you're an evangelical or you're an early church Christian. We should be one body, taking advantage of both lungs, both sides of the church. The body will never come together until they learn and examine these passages of Scripture, lay down their personal opinions, independent of the Word of God, and like the Jews need to repent for rejecting their Messiah, 
They need to repent for rejecting the order of the kingdom of heaven that God has established. Especially the great cloud of witnesses praying from heaven and the set-apart and appointed privilege of Our Lady in heaven, the soul whose womb God's only begotten Son was entrusted to by our Heavenly Father. You see, in heaven the Holy Spirit flows through everyone. So a saint is easily aware of a petition to them to pray for a situation in the same way that on earth we become aware of a need to pray for someone by the Holy Spirit. And if they insist that Jesus is our only mediator, why do we have intercessors and intercessory prayer groups standing in the gap? Don't be fooled. Someday soon, the veil will come down and the body of Christ will be united in biblical truth and the opinions of men will be shown as being nothing more than a puff of smoke, and all men will agree on truth. And for those of you who are in the liturgical churches and turn your nose up at the evangelicals, shame on you. They have great gifts to offer. They have gone far with what they have. We need to be brothers and sisters united under Christ. One body, one head, one heart, one mind, one gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.